the church. Y'all can filter on in. We're going to get started. Good morning, church. Man, you guys are very social this morning. Uh, my name is Stephen Bradley. I'm one of the members here at, at Emmanuel, and I wanted to welcome you to Emmanuel Baptist Church this morning for worship. A couple of, of housekeeping items. This Sunday is Simple Sunday, correct? Which means that we are not going to have uh, child care as usual, uh, but the kids will stay in here and worship with us. Um, also, instead of verbally announcing all the announcements, there are these, and there's a big box of them back there in the corner. If you haven't gotten one, this is going to keep you up to date on what's going on in our church. Well, let's transition now. The body of Christ gathers to worship Jesus, um, and so uh, I don't know about you, but this week I, I was reminded personally and, and as a community of just how things aren't the way they should be. Um, that this world is broken by sin, and and so it was very discouraging. And, and so I turned to the Word, and, and I want to show you, and I'm just going to share this with you this morning, what the Lord put on my heart um, this week. I hope it was encouraging to me. I hope it's encouraging to you. But uh, if we could listen to, this is from Romans chapter 8, um, and this will kind of guide us into focus this morning. God's word says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery of corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one also hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, by the word of your mouth, you created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. You formed us by the dust of the ground, by the rib of Adam. In your image, man and woman, we were created. And God, we sinned and we rebelled against you. And in doing so, we broke our relationship with you, with each other, with the creation around us. We were without hope, but you who are rich in mercy with your great love with which you loved us. God, you sent your son Jesus to die so that we might live. And God, while we're reminded this week of the brokenness of sin in the world around us and in our own lives, help us, Lord, to hope in you. Help us, Lord, to focus on you this time of worship with the body of Christ, Lord, I pray that Jesus would be magnified above all else. I pray that you would help us to um, put aside the burden uh, that we walked in here with and help us to worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. It's in Jesus' heavenly and precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? Let's lift our voices in worship this morning. What love could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they 
are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Amen. You can be seated. Before, before we have our time of pastoral prayer, uh, we're going to state our faith together by reciting the Apostles' Creed. And the words will be on the screen for us. Let's do that together now. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and was buried, he descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, Um, and also before our time of pastoral prayer, I want to encourage you to be praying uh, for one another as a church body each week. We should be praying for those uh, members and loved ones in the church. We should be praying for our country in this upcoming election. Uh, we should be praying for global affairs. And uh, if you do not know, uh, Hurricane Helene has uh, struck our country and many states, including Western NC, and they um, many are suffering loss. There, countless people have lost their lives. We do not know yet, and um, there are others that are suffering uh, from from the rising flood waters. So keep them in your prayers this week. And uh, now let's worship together to God and call on Him in prayer. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We praise your great and awesome name this morning for your holy and worthy of our praise. 
May you bless this time of service and our worship of you. And in our praises, prayers, and sermons, may the name of Christ be extolled. For Jesus is our beautiful Savior and our treasure that we desire above all things. We declare today that we love you, O Lord, and your holy statutes. And we give thanks to you for first loving us and for your enduring love that never ends. Even when we are unfaithful to you, for you are always faithful to us. We pray now for our country in this upcoming election of our president. May you install a president that is best fit for the advancement of your kingdom and our continued freedom to worship you as we please and by your instruction. We pray now for our world and those who are suffering at loss in tragic war times, including the war in Palestine and Israel and the war in Ukraine and Russia. We pray for peace for these and for the gospel to abound in hope for those in need. We pray now for those inflicted by Hurricane Helene. By the power of your arm and mighty strength, you have brought a great storm against this nation. Many have lost their lives and countless others are suffering under the weight of the storm and the flood waters that you have summoned to rise. Lord, we do not understand why you bring storms like this or plan such tragedies in war around our world, but one thing we know for sure is that your wisdom is true and perfect, and your power is truly good, always seeking the good of your children and the increase of your glory. Therefore, despite these tragedies, and precisely because of these tragedies, we trust in you. And we pray for the hurricane and flood victims. May you hear those who are crying out to a Savior. Out of your gladness and by looking on your Son, may you save those who are crying out to you. Incline your ear to the one to the ones who are pleading for and in desperate need of a rescuer and a redeemer. Do not resent those who would never call on your name before this tragedy and are only doing so today because of this tragedy. But according to your mercy, listen to those who are crying to you. Use this tragedy to draw people to you who otherwise wouldn't come. And according to your grace and your plan that you have decided before time, May you extend salvation to those who need it. And Lord, we pray for those in our church. We have some who have recently married, some who are having children, those who are eating and drinking in their neighbor's house, those who are rejoicing and laughing together, those who feel near to you. For these we are so thankful, and we praise you, for peace has come to your house inside the body of this church, and it is all due to Christ and what he accomplished for us on the cross. But we also pray for those who are suffering inside our church. We have shut-ins, those with physical ailments, those who are suffering emotionally, those who have lost a loved one, those who have miscarried a child, those who are anxious, and those who feel far from you. For these, O oh healer, we pray that you would heal. For these, we lift up to you and give them over to your tender care. We are encouraged by your words through the Apostle Paul that our suffering is not in vain. None of our hurting is meaningless, for we look to you to redeem us of all things in the end. Bless now this time of giving. May we give cheerfully and out of sincerity as is pleasing to you, for we know God loves a cheerful giver. And bless this sermon this morning so that our great need of you is exposed to us and to all, and so the name of Christ is exalted. Amen. Now we'll have our time of giving.
stand. As we sing this song together, I want us to think about this promise from Scripture, and it's that he who began a work in us will bring it to completion. Let's sing this together. Complete in thee, no work of mine could take, dear Lord, the place of thine. Thy blood hath drawn and bought for me, and I shall stand complete in thee. Yea, justified, O oh, blessed God, and sanctified salvation. Rod, thy blood hath poured and bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Complete in thee, each one supplied, and no good thing to me denied, since thou my portion, Lord. I ask no more, complete in thee. Yea, justified, O blessed God, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned and bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. Complete in thee, no more shall sin. Thy grace hath conquered reign within. Thy blood shall bid the tempter flee, and I shall stand complete in thee. Dear Savior, when before thy bar all try and tongues assembled are among the chosen I shall be at thy right hand complete in thee yea justified O blessed thought and sanctified salvation wrought thy blood hath pardoned and bought for me glorified I too shall be yea justified O blessed Lord and sanctified salvation wrought thy blood hath pardoned and bought for me and glorified I too shall be thy blood for me and glorified I too shall be all God's people said amen you can be seated As we continue our journey through the four-part story of Scripture, today we read the tragic account of sin and the fall of mankind. Hear these words, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the trees that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called wife, his wife's name, Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. This is God's word. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to the worship of the people of God for the living God this morning. It's so good to see all of you here today. You can go ahead, and if you have a copy of the Scriptures, flip to Genesis 3. I'm used to dismissing the kids at this time, but I love Simple Sundays because uh, we get to have a few extra guests in the uh, service. I also love to hear uh, the singing of God's people. Uh, when we have just the guitar, I can hear the roar of voices behind me, and it's so encouraging to hear uh, the voices of his people sing his praises. And thank you, Britt, and all the other uh, people who minister to us this morning. I uh, thank you, Renee, for reading. We have <clears throat> before us a huge text. Uh, this is packed full of meaning, and I want to give you a disclaimer this morning. Not only is nothing I'm going to say new to me, uh, it is in no way uh, my creation. Uh, there has been thousands upon thousands of uh, years of commentary and work done on this amazing, packed full of truth text. So, I'm not going to really say anything that's original to me. You can assume that I have done study. I've had a lot of help this week from a lot of great minds of the past, some that have passed on, some that are still alive. Uh, I've been able to 
study, and I have been greatly enriched this week by this beautiful chapter, uh, even with its difficult sections. So just a disclaimer up front, uh, don't expect your pastors to reinvent the wheel. We are humble students of, of uh, God's Word, just like uh, you. So that's one thing. Another thing is we're not going to be able to cover everything in this chapter. Now, you do realize this chapter is packed from beginning to end packed. Uh, We could dive into this for weeks upon months. Scholars have worked on it for years, and it is a beautiful, powerful, ancient, ancient text. So you have to remember, we're on a plane ride, right? We're in this four-part story, so if you don't feel completely like you've mastered the text in all of its entirety or if you are disappointed in me by the end of the sermon because I haven't given you enough data on some nuance that you wanted clarity on, I must encourage you, alas, we have not the time. So, with that being said, though, I do want us to get to the heart of the text today, and that's going to be pretty simple, hopefully. Uh, But before we dive in, uh, we have to remember where we are. We're in this journey through the four-part story, right, as a church. We are going through the whole of Scripture in a speedy plane ride to enable us to grasp the larger story, right? And that story is broken into four parts. Maybe you can say them with me. Uh, Pretty easy because they'll be up there for you. But four parts, right? Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. There we go. And that's the four basic parts of Scripture, the, the flow of the whole story. And these four sections, remember, they... They answer and deal with fundamental questions that all human beings ask and that you ask every day in some way. And that is, where did we come from? What happened? What in the world happened to this, to this world? We're going to talk about that especially today. What hope do we have and where are we going? These are fundamental questions that we'll be exploring. And that always leads us to put flesh on the, those four pieces we see four recurring themes that we're going to hit throughout the story. And that is God's people in God's place, under God's covenant rule and blessing, through God's king. And last week we talked about creation, and God's people at this point in the story are Adam and Eve, human beings that he's made in his place, which is Eden, where his, where his presence dwells, And under his covenant rule and blessing, they are to spread Eden to all the reaches of the earth. And as long as they obey God's one command and they eat of the tree of life forever, and the person who's supposed to represent us before the Father and who's supposed to administrate all of this and make sure that it's carried out is God's king, which at this point is Adam. So now we're going to see, sadly, how the story takes a turn for the worst, as you already know well. So all we're going to do is we're going to talk about sin today. Now, I realize sin is a topic that in many ways in the modern world comes in and out of vogue. Uh, There are seasons where sin is a kind of a, a, a dirty word we don't like to talk about, kind of an archaic idea that human beings sin. We're really more determined by our upbringing and our chemistry and our brain chemistry and all that stuff. It's not, it's what is really sin. But if you, if you actually follow the course of history, sin comes in and out of vogue. Uh, We're talking more about it today in academia, the concept of uh, sin, that we do things that are inherently wrong, that are uh, against the fundamental assumptions of morality in our culture. Well, we're going to talk about the Christian vision of sin. Uh, what the Bible teaches about sin. And the way we're going to do it is three simple things. We're going to look at the origin of sin. We're going to look at the effects of sin, what comes about by the introduction of sin. And then we're going to end with hope for sinners. Uh, and I hope that you look forward especially to that third one. So let's, let's start with the origin of sin. Those first six verses kind of give us this story of where this new experience enters the narrative. Up to this point, sin's a foreign concept to our parents. Adam and Eve know not of what that word means. Uh, They haven't had this experience. But we see how this starts with the serpent entering the garden and tempting Eve. 
Well, before we go into that, maybe you're wondering, like I often wonder, and many people have wondered, why this test? Why did God do it this way? Um, have you ever wondered, well, why did God put the tree in the garden? Couldn't he just maybe have skipped that little feature? Could he have just left that little shrub out and just everything else would have been fine? Why put the tree in the garden? Why do this? Is, is, maybe you've wondered, is this even fair of, of God to place the, the, the item of their curse right there in front of them and sort of to tempt them, you know? Uh, I've thought that throughout my whole life. I've struggled with that when I was young, especially. Maybe you wonder that. Is this a fair thing? What is this test about? Well, to be honest with you, it's really a simple test. If you read the text and think about it, it's pretty simple. What God is trying to do is ask the question, will you, Adam and Eve, will you obey me? Will you obey me? Do you trust me? Do you trust me? Will you obey me? Just for who I am, do you, do you trust me? And he's giving them a free, a genuinely free choice. And we know that, that love and relationship is largely based on a genuinely free choice. Like if your spouse made you, forced you to love you against your will, it wouldn't be love, right? God wants to see if they will genuinely choose to obey him, to trust him, and he gives this, them this opportunity. That This tree represents an opportunity for Adam and Eve to let God be God and to trust his timing, wisdom, and character. Now, the alternative could be pretty simple. You're saying, well, don't you? Well, that seems like an okay idea. I guess they can have a genuine decision. That's great and all. But don't you think he could have explained it a little more? Maybe giving them a little, look, if you eat this, look, uh, you're going to have a child in a few years. He's going to kill your other child. Then all your descendants are going to fight. Wars are going to break out. Uh, bombs are going to go off. I mean, literally, the world's going to fall apart. Let me show you the details. Maybe he could have tried an alternate route. Here's why the tree is bad. Look, it's, it's poisonous. Uh, it doesn't taste good. Um, it'll do this to you, you know, give you a runny nose or whatever. It, anything. God could have added some information to maybe fill in the colors and, and make it a little harder for them to, to add to the tree. Always said, if you eat it, you're going to die. You think that would be enough. But you have to wonder, why could, could God just explain more? Why didn't he tell them what was really at stake? Well, if you think about it, the result of that would be pretty simple. Adam and Eve would then have to weigh the options of obeying, and they would have to assess the situation for themselves. What's really good for them or what's not? So they would essentially be making the decision based on themselves, how it affected them, how they assessed if it was worth it or not to obey God. They would be assessing the situation for themselves. What is this? This would ultimately make the decision based on them. How they judged if it was worth it or not to eat it. It wouldn't be based off God. So in other words, what is this church? It's a pretty simple thing. This is a genuine test of virtue. It's a genuine test of goodness. Y'all, we don't use the word virtue a lot today, right? Um, if you might call someone virtuous occasionally, somebody accuse you of being Shakespeare at work or something. But if we use that word, virtue really means goodness, right? Goodness. Uh, if you call a person virtuous, then they're good. They're a good person. Well, when you think about virtue, all throughout history, theologians and philosophers have written about different types of virtue. Aristotle postulated different types of virtue, Augustine, Aquinas. But I think one of my favorites from a, a pastor, a theologian that I was studying this week who referenced Jonathan Edwards. Uh, you, many of you know of Jonathan Edwards. He writes on virtue, and he, he comes up with two types of virtue, common virtue and true virtue. Those are his labels. Now, common virtue works like this. If you're in your workplace 
you know, you're very concerned about working and being around people that are virtuous, right? You want to work for someone who is virtuous. You want to work with people who are virtuous. That's at least the hope. Well, you might ask yourself, why be virtuous? Why? Well, many people are virtuous for two not-so-great reasons. The first one being fear. Many of us do good things out of fear, right? If I tell a lie at work, I might get caught, and it just won't work out well for me. Well, why are you being honest? Out of fear. You're scared of being caught, okay? If God would have given reasons to Adam and Eve uh, upon the end of the whole future, they could obey out of fear, okay? That's not what God's after. Another, another motivation that we obey, what's another reason many people do the right thing? Have you ever heard, we don't do that in this house? Anybody grew up hearing that? We're Tillmans. We don't do that. Uh, we're Christians. We don't act that way. We're Americans. We don't do that this way. We're whatever, fill in the gap. What's the motivation behind doing that good thing? Pride. So the first one might be fear. You're scared of doing wrong because you might get caught. Things might bad happen, What this, that, and the other. Or you might obey just out of pride. The fact that people like me do things right in this way. That's just pride. If you, if you think about that, what's at the root of your reason to obey? Sin. Sin is at the root of those motivations. The fear and pride, that's what motivates us to do good. But Edwards talks about, the, that's what he calls common virtue, everyday virtue, the reason why most of the world is virtuous. And praise God for common virtue, because if we didn't have those restraints, this world would be unlivable, it would be a nightmare. But the higher virtue, what, what Edwards calls true virtue, is what, what is it when a person is genuinely virtuous? How, ha, virtuous? How do you have true virtue? When you obey or do good simply for the sake of doing good. Simply because you love God. You love who He is. God is good. Does that make sense? This is an opportunity for Adam and Eve not to obey out of fear... And not to obey out of pride, but to obey genuinely out of love for God and who He is. You know what? I know God, and He put the tree here for a reason. And He told us not to eat of it. And He said we'll die, whatever that means. They don't know what, they haven't seen death yet. So He says that we're going to do this die word, okay? We're going to die. And I trust God that that's a good enough reason, and I'm just going to trust Him because you know what? I've been around God a lot, and He is good. And if He says we shouldn't do it, we can trust Him. He's our Father. We love Him. It's no problem. Let's not eat of the tree. Can you see the test, church? Can you see how even today we struggle with obeying and doing right or wrong out of fear or pride? How many times have you done what's wrong because you were afraid of the consequences? How many times have you done what's right just because you were proud of doing what was right? But I ask you a deeper question. How many times have you truly done what was good and virtuous simply because you love God and God is good and virtuous? If we're honest with ourselves, you'll find pretty quickly that We've probably never done that perfectly, have we? Our motives are always a little, just a little mixed. Have you ever obeyed God and you love God and you, and you know God's good, but you also are a little hesitant that if I do this wrong, God might allow some bad things into my life. Anyone ever done that? Uh, by the way, I know you all have. We all accidentally operate like that about 24-7. Do we not? God's going to let me have cancer. if I. Uh, God's going to make my business fail. God's going to work it out where I get in a car accident. You know, have you ever thought things like that? 
We, we might not fully believe them, but they're there, right? You think them like, is God going to let something bad happen to me, whatever? So we still tend to obey out of fear. And if we're not usually fearful, we're prideful. You know, we do this because we're cleaned up good Christian folks. See, it's hard to get to the, to the root of true virtue, to just love goodness for the sake of goodness. If no one ever saw you do it and never knew you did, you would still do it. See, that's the, the thing we lost in the fall. That's the test that is given here to our parents. So I want you to look at the tactics that this deceiver uses, the serpent. I love the, the old King James where it says the serpent was more subtle, you know, than any beast of the field. He's crafty. He's sneaky, right? He's subtle, and he subtly deceives, which is lying. But you notice the type of lies he, he constructs aren't full-bodied lies. They're like partial half-lies, which are, by the way, the most dangerous. A blatant lie is sometimes way easier to spot, but one that's got, you know, 40% truth in it is really easy to believe. And that's what the serpent does. What does he say? Did God actually say? Don't you love that word? Have you ever been asked that by a child? Actually? You know, really? You know, the, the serpent in that archetypal way is saying, did God actually say that? Can't you? He didn't come out and say, no, God did not say that. You, shouldn't, you should believe me, not him. No, he, he says, did, he just plants a little seed, a little seed of doubt in the heart of Eve about God's word. Now, you have to remember, at this point, remember our story before. Who was the original law given to? Adam. God gave Adam the law of not to eat of the tree before he made Eve. Remember, because Adam is supposed to be functioning as our representative. He's supposed to be our prophet, priest, and king, right? He's supposed to bring the word of God to Eve and to all of his children. So Eve learned of this law from Adam. Think about that. So the doubt here is easier because the doubt plays on the fact that Eve wasn't technically there in person when God gave the law. So he goes, did God actually say that? And Eve, you know, uh, well, I mean, that's what Adam said. You know, I don't know. I wasn't there. You know, so you see this seed of doubt? And this doubt, what does doubt draw its power from, church? How is doubt powerful? Fear. Doubt draws its power from fear. The only reason doubt is scary is because you're doubting the truth in light of a lie, right? So you're scared of something that may or may not happen. It's, it draws its power from fear. Her fear here is, what if I didn't get all the information? You know, like, well, I, I'm pretty sure that's what he said. And you notice she doesn't quote God perfectly. She quite, just a subtle alteration. She says, and don't even touch it. Now, that is a logical next step. If you shouldn't eat it, you probably shouldn't touch it. But technically, if you go back, did God say not to touch it? No. God told Adam and Eve not to eat of it. So, she's already got slight variations on God's original law. So, this doubt finds a, a good spot to land in her heart and that's the devil's tactics, to slightly make us doubt God's words. And that draws its, fear, its power from fear. But then what does he say? You will not, now he finally comes out and just says it. You will not surely die. For God knows <clears throat> that when you eat, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. What's the temptation here? Pride. He appeals to her pride. You know what? God, Eve, actually, God is holding you down. God is scared because he knows when you eat of it, you will be like him. So you can't trust him. You should call the shots. You know what? 
You deserve to be like a God, don't you, Eve? You, you should want to be like God. You should know good from evil. The root of this is fear, yes. The fear is uh, maybe I'm missing out on something very important. And it appeals to her pride. Because, hey, you're going to be like a God if you eat this. It just makes sense. You see the deception of the serpent. And then, sadly, we have to deal with our rebellion. Eve, as we know, she believes the lie, church. She falls for it. She doubts God's word. And by doing that, doubts his goodness, which is the source of all this. He, she doubts that he's good. Maybe he is a monster, like you say, snake. He doubt, she doubts, and she asserts her own prerogative, and what does she do? She takes the fruit, and she eats. She assesses it, decides it's good, takes it, and she eats. Now, what's interesting here is the way the rest of the Bible talks about this moment. Y'all, you all know that Jesus is the second. The Bible says explicitly that Jesus is the second Eve, Right? Is that what it says? No. It calls him the second Adam. And all of Scripture calls it the sin of Eve, right? No. It's the sin of Adam. Why is that? Who sinned first? It, 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 appears, that, that, it appears here that Eve sinned first. Well, if you think about it, the, the text goes on to say, and her husband who was with her, she gave to eat, and he ate as well. What does that mean? Did he just appear? No, it said, the text says he was with her. So during this whole temptation, what is so significant about Adam that the rest of the story calls it Adam's sin? And it calls Jesus, our Redeemer, the second Adam. Why not the second Eve? Why not Eve's sin? Well, it's because, remember, Adam holds that special office as the first one that was made. And that is our representative before God. Adam was supposed to be our prophet, our priest, our king. He's supposed to reign over Eden with Eve, right? Well, what's the prophet, priest, king doing here, church? What's he doing? He's a coward. Adam, this is probably the most significant, not probably, it is, the most significant sin in all of Scripture. And everyone goes, oh, the most significant? Wait a second. We're about to witness a murder in a few chapters. Oh, 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 wait a second. Noah's day was no one on the whole earth except one family was doing anything good. And you're saying this is worse? Oh, we've experienced World War II, maybe three <laughs> someday. Like, We've experienced all... You're saying this little sin of him standing beside Eve is worse? Yes. You know why? This sin is the fountainhead of all those other sins. It flows from this moment. The prophet role, he just abdicates. He just skips. What's the prophet supposed to do? They're supposed to bring God's word. Speak God's word. What does Adam do? Does Adam speak up? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, no. Actually, I was there, serpent, snake, person thing. I was there. God said this. This is God's word. No, did he do that? No. He, he doesn't step up. At, what is a priest supposed to do? Mediate God's presence. Bring people into God's worship. What could, what could Adam have done here, church? Hey, whoa, whoa. But Eve, let's go to the Father. Come, come with me. I, I, we can go. He, he walks with us in the cool of the day. He knows us. We can call on him. He, he loves us, Eve. He'll come. He'll talk with us. Let's go to the Father. Does, does Adam do that? No. He sits there. And ultimately, he's God's king. He's supposed to defend God's law. He should have said, whoa, stop, and gotten in between the snake and Eve and said, no, 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 no. Uh, God's law is pretty simple. We're not eating of it. Thank you. You may slither on your way. We're going to live. We believe God. We love God. What does he do? He abdicates. He abdicates. 
Throughout history, monarchs have abdicated out of, out of weakness, and people have, you know, because it takes a lot to be a good monarch, um, and people have given them flack. There is no, there is no end to the flack we should give Adam. This abdication trumps all abdications. The, the, the moment we needed the king, the prophet priest, the, the head of Eden, the good father, of our race, the moment we needed him more than ever, where was he? Cowering in the corner, waiting to see what happens when his wife, his bride, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, he's going to just wait and see what happens to her. How is this going to pan out? It's a terrible abdication. At the, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, this moment represents humanity's choice to live independently from God. And ever since this moment, we have been living in the chaos we live in today. This is where it flows from. This is the root of all human brokenness. It's a rejection of God, of His rule, and it leads to separation from him and therefore from life itself. That's the origin of sin. Well, quickly, I want you to see in verses 7 through 13, we see the effects of sin. It doesn't just stop there. Sin doesn't just appear. We have these terrible effects. First of all, right off the bat, we see shame and guilt. What did they do? Their eyes were opened, right? They could tell that they were naked, and they hide. They hide. They cover. What do they sew together? They sew fig leaves for themselves. They immediately are vulnerable and have lost their innocence. They're no longer, like I mentioned before, like children in peace with themselves. They're, they're now not at peace with their own bodies. They, they don't want others to see them. They hide. They cover they run. And then when God comes into the garden, what happens? They hide from God. So they just don't cover up and hide from one another's eyes. They now hear the sound of God in the garden and want to hide from God, who they've walked with, who they've known intimately. They run from Him. They're hiding from Him. Not only that, but blame and denial what happens? God comes to him and says, where are you? Now, was, was God looking for coordinates? No. God knew who were there. Have you ever played that game with your kids where you come in, oh, no, where's Bobby? Where's Sally? And you can see them sticking out from behind the, you know, the, the recliner or whatever. It, it, everyone, every adult in the room knows where the child is, but the child's got his eyes covered, so they think you don't know. It's like you could hide from the creator of the universe. You know, they think some fig leaves and hiding behind of a bush is going to keep them away from God. Well, God, in his infinite wisdom and mercy, he goes, where are you? Where are you? He knows where they are. What, is, what does this show us about God? God, like we said, he's relational church. He's pursuing. Did you know he's asking you the same question today? Where are you? Where are you? Your father wants to know where you are. Where are you? Are you in Christ? Have you come into my presence through my son? Are you lost and adrift? Are you hurting? Are you broken today? Where are you? That's the humble cry here in the garden to Adam and Eve, his children. Where are you? And what, what happens? Adam comes out and immediately... He says, hey, I, we're, we're naked. We, didn't, we, didn't, we wanted to hide from you. And God's like, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I told you not to eat of? And what happens? It's amazing. A new emotion, a new experience enters the human story. Blame and denial, okay? So when you blame someone, by the way, for something that you participated in, that is denial, right? You're denying the truth. You're not in touch with reality. So instead of Adam saying, God, I was, the, I was the king of Eden. I was supposed to represent them. You know what? And I messed up. It's my fault. I'm sorry. Kill me. Take my life and just save Eve. It wasn't her fault. 
He doesn't do that. What's the first thing Adam does? Adam, Adam points. It's, it's in, it blows my mind, and, and we do this all the time today, but it's, it's so interesting that it happens so quick in this moment. Adam immediately blames Eve, and he has the audacity. 20 minutes before, he was in relationship with the divine. Now he's in rebellion, and he has the audacity to point and wave his finger at God himself. The, the woman that, who? You made for me. Can you imagine the, the pride and arrogance here of our representative? The woman you made for me. Apparently, when you were designing her, there was a, a bug in the system. But the woman that you supposedly made for me, she gave it to me to eat. So he's blaming Eve, but ultimately, church, he's actually blaming God. It's God's fault that Adam sat there like a coward. You see the denial here of reality? It wasn't God. God didn't make Adam stand there and do nothing. It was Adam's choice, was it not? It's, it lies at Adam's feet, but Adam, he denies it. He points to Eve and ultimately God. And then what? what can you imagine the fear that rushed into Eve's heart there? Now is a time for Adam. And I want you to see the rest of the human race there in that moment. All of us are there in Adam and Eve. Can you identify with Eve for a moment? You understand Adam because you're sinners too. But identify with Eve now. Maybe your husband is going to stand in your place for you. Right? Maybe he's going to stand up for you. Maybe he's going to watch out for you. Maybe he's going to get in between you and God. Maybe he's going to own up to what he's done. So Eve's standing there, and then the first thing your husband does, it's her fault. She did it, and you made her that way. Can you imagine the pain and the stress of Eve at that moment? All eyes shift to Eve. Eve's been totally betrayed here by the one that's supposed to love her well. And Eve, what does Eve do? Is she better than Adam? God, you're right. It is my fault. No. She blames the snake. That thing you let in, whatever it is, it spoke to me, and that's why I did it. That It tricked me. It's his fault. Not that she had the free choice to listen to God, and she knew God. She could have done that, but no. She points to the snake. So we see blame, blame shifting. Do you blame shift? Oh, man, are we not pros? Uh, especially <laughs> friendships and marriages. Key examples. If you've got a really close friend or if you're married, if you're in close proximity to another human, it is amazing the opportunities we have for blame shifting. Uh, I won't list who the person is that I'm really close to, but I'm particularly close to one specific woman. And <laughs> it's amazing in those relationships how you have opportunities. You know you did something wrong, but before you're even going to entertain what you did wrong, you have to make sure they know what they did wrong. <laughs> well, actually, well, you did this. You know, well, I, I, well, yeah, yeah, I did. But I did that because you did this. Blame shifting. We're experts at blame shifting. Nobody goes, yes, I love owning when I do wrong. Like, sign me up. We are sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, are we not? We love to blame shift. And look, we live in denial all the time. We live in a state of denial. You see, sin brings about these things. Sin brings about shame, guilt, broken relationships between uh, ourselves and others, and ultimately between the most important relationship between us and God. And we feel the weight of this brokenness right now, today, through conflict, anxiety, and is, do any of you have a deep sense as a human being of unrest? A deep sense of unrest. I'm here today to argue a pretty big thesis, but it's pretty simple. All of this flows from sin. 
it flows from this poison that has been allowed into the human heart. And once this happens, sadly, we see more results, God's judgment and separation. God comes to them, and you notice who he starts with. He starts with the last one that was blamed, the snake. And he curses the snake. He says, you're going to crawl on your belly. This, this means the snake is going to be shamed, and a struggle is now going to ensue between, what does he say, between your offspring, snake, and between the offspring of who? The woman. So right now, we're talking about a story, remember? This is a huge setup moment. Okay, if you watch Lord of the Rings, this is the opening scene that explains the rings. It's like, you can't get the rest of the story without this. And there is going to be this titanic struggle between what the, the story calls the seed of the snake and the seed of the woman. We're going to see this struggle play out in, in generations after this. You see, those that remain faithful to God and trust in Him are the seed of the woman. And those that rebel and fight and want to be God, they want to build towers like the Tower of Babel, they want to build cities that glorify themselves, those are people that identify with the snake. They're the seed of the snake. And there's this huge conflict woven all through history between the descendants of this serpent, not physical descendants, but spiritual descendants, and the descendants of the woman. Then he gives consequences for humanity. Uh, first of all, uh, theologians have listed this in many ways, but I'll give you the simple version. The first main result is that hiding now becomes normal. Hiding is normal. There's going to always be fig leaves, quote-unquote, between individuals and between God and man. There's going to be conflict. Uh, theologians would call this the psychological alienation, even from our own selves, right? Adam is in denial, which means inside Adam and Eve. They're both in denial. They are no longer whole as a person. They are psychologically alienated from their own selves, they are saying one thing that's true when in reality something totally different is not true, and they're in denial of the truth. Not only that, but pain and childbirth. Can you think about that? The creating life is now deadly. You see the reversals of that? Creating life, this good thing that Eve was to do, to with Adam's help, she forms creatures in her womb, image bearers, that now can spread the rule and reign of Eden around the earth. This good, gracious gift of creating life now has the extreme danger and hazard of bringing death and pain. It's a reversal of God's good order that comes from sin. Gender roles are broken. You notice he talks about the, the wife will have the, a desire for her husband. That word desire is like a longing, a brokenness within her heart towards her husband, a longing for a wholeness from the, the man, not from God, a wholeness from the man. And it says, but he will rule over you. That word rule is the Hebrew word dominate. So it will not, he's not going to lead you anymore. It's going to be kind of on average, men have this temptation to dominate women, and women have this temptation to make an idol out of the relationship, that they need a man to exist, to be a person. And you also see the mixing of those. Sometimes those roles are flipped. Sometimes you have a man completely passive and a woman in control. In other words, what's happened? The train tracks were supposed to be like this, and they went, they've gone haywire. Our relationships as men and women between the sexes is broken. It's broken. It's messed up. This could be sociological alienation is what society is broken, is what theologians would call it. Work now is toil. Nature 
is against us. You know, by the way, work did not come from the fall. Everyone knows that, right? Work was pre-fall. Work is supposed to give meaning. It's supposed to give joy. It's supposed to be the constant adventure of making Eden the way it's supposed to be and spreading the order and glory of Eden. Work is good. Work is good, church. But work has now been corrupted because it is full of toil and pain and resistance and misery. Can anybody identify? (laughs) Work can be misery. Work can be toil. Does, Does your work just submit to you? When you go and garden in your backyard, do the weeds just fall sideways, you know, when you approach them? No, not at all. They, they resist you. You might get them all out, and the next morning, it seems like the dew has caused a whole flock of new weeds to grow. The, they're against your will. Our work resists us. Not only that, but nature is now broken. An ecological alienation. The the ground that we were supposed to have a great relationship with to work and to keep, it's against us. Also, that beautiful text that Stephen quoted this morning, all of nature is groaning. Nature itself, this place that was supposed to be our Eden that we spread, that was supposed to be something we govern, do we govern nature? Does anyone here feel in charge of nature? We, God has prepared this sermon for this moment because we learned this week as a nation, did we not? We have no control over this world. This world that was supposed to be a habitation and a home and a safety place for us is now actively trying to kill us. Anybody been around a lion that just walks up to you and just rubs up against you and is fine with your presence? No. What does the lion do? It doesn't want to just hurt you. A lion wants to kill you. It doesn't see you as an image bearer, a prince of its mighty king representing him now. It doesn't bow before you. It resists you. Even nature is broken, and it goes all the way down to the dirt. What does God say? You now will die For from dirt, dust you came, and to dust you shall return. Look, the thing that we were taken out of, that we're supposed to nurture into life, to glorify God, to spread, instead of us governing the earth, we're going to be six feet under the earth at the end of our days. To dust we return. We have no governance over this ground. All of these things are brought about by sin. And the worst one of all is the last one. We're alienated from God. God has to take His son and daughter, Adam and Eve, He has to remove them from His garden paradise. His garden temple where He dwells on earth, they can't be there anymore. He puts a a cherubim there to guard them. He he has to get them out of his presence. Why? Because sin can't be in the presence of Almighty God. He's too holy. He's too good. So all of humanity's struggles, our suffering, hard labor, our pain, our death, all flow from this moment of separation from God. But what's amazing is number three, the last one I hope you've been holding out for, it, and that's that even in judgment, there's a hint of God's redemption. So number three, the hope for sinners. If this is where sin comes from, and this is what sin has done to us, well, what hope do we have? It's pretty simple. I skipped it slightly if you caught where I was going through the text. Look in verse 15 of chapter 3. Renee read it, and some of you, I even heard remarks in the crowd, and it made me joyful. This is what's called the Proto-Evangelion, the the Proto-Gospel, the early Gospel, the first glimpse of the good news. Genesis 3.15, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, he's talking to the snake, and between your offspring and her offspring. He, singular, he, he shall bruise your head, 
and you shall bruise his heel. The writer of Hebrews and Romans both point out the importance of that singular use. There's a singular offspring of the woman coming. Church, what is this right here? A snake crusher is on his way. A snake crusher is on his way. God's not going to leave this story to itself. That word for bruise is like to utterly crush. So he is going to utterly crush your head, snake, although you're going to utterly crush his heel. So there's going to be a huge price paid by the, the son of the woman. But your head is going to be crushed by him. You're going to crush his heel. You're going to wound him terribly. But he's going to crush your head. And it's over. Can you imagine the, that ringing in the ears of Satan the deceiver at this point? It's been promised. There's a day coming. A snake crusher is on his way. If I, I was going to try and illustrate this. If I drop, we don't like snakes, you know, most of us. If you do, you have a problem. But if I dropped a snake right now, right in the middle of the aisle, well, I'd love to see what would happen. It's just screaming, panic. Everyone runs away. Uh, probably no one is going to run towards the snake. Maybe one or two of you are really heroic and will go grab some type of instrument to kill the, the venomous snake. One of my favorite uh, illustrations of what I'm trying to get at here, it comes from a movie. You may have not seen it. Uh, I'm not crazy about, I love the Marvel movies, but I'm, I'm not a Captain America fan. I'm actually a, a Iron Man fan, just so everyone knows. But if you really love Captain America, if you've read those comics or watched those movies, there's a moment, you remember Captain America was this scrawny little teenager. And the only time I've ever teared up in a Marvel movie, other than when, I, when Iron Man died, spoiler alert if you haven't watched it, but <laughs> the only time I've ever teared up in a Marvel movie, because I don't take them very seriously, and it still chokes me up, I'm probably going to have a hard time talking about it, um, is uh, in, Captain, uh, in Captain America's first movie, he's this scrawny little picked on, bullied teenager, itty bitty, and he's chosen to be this superhero that's turned into this mighty warrior. And he, you know, he becomes huge, and he basically can't die, and he's like super strong. But originally, he was this little shrimp that with nothing going for him. And the general is making fun of the decision that this little scrawny guy is going to be the Captain America. You've picked him to be the Captain America? And the woman who's trying to get a point across at why he should be picked, she walks up, and she, she nonchalantly takes her grenade, and she pulls the pin out and throws it on the ground. And everyone runs, obviously, because it's a live grenade, except who? Captain America. He runs, and he jumps on the grenade and puts his body over it and says, Get away! Get away! Get away! He's willing to, to die, to run towards the problem. Can I tell you something, church? No one in all of history has run towards the problem except one. Jesus saw the snake, and unlike Adam, where Adam ran and cowered, Jesus ran towards the snake. He jumped on the snake. He wrestled with the dragon knowing he was going to die while he did it. He jumped on the grenade. In all of history, no one has loved us like our true husband. Our, the second Adam, no one's loved you like Jesus has. No one came to our rescue. Our father left us. He abandoned us. He stood on the corner and watched at what would happen if his wife would die. He, 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 he abdicated but what did God do in Jesus Christ? He runs towards what? What's the, what's the moment, the grenade where the snake is crushed, the, the moment of greatest terror? It's the cross. Jesus ran to the cross. 
It says, for the what that was set before him? The joy. Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. He asked the Father in the garden, is there any other way? Take it from me. I don't want to do this. But it says, but for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Do you know that Jesus didn't go to the cross begrudgingly for you? Jesus joyfully, he ran to a tree to be butchered and massacred and hung naked in front of his mother and friends and family. He ran with all his might to be separated from his father. Why? To save you, to save me, to save his bride. Church, Jesus did it. It is finished. Jesus has crushed the snake. It's over. It's past tense. We're not back there in Genesis looking to a day when this will come true. It is past tense. The snake is crushed. He's gone. It's his power over this world is broken. He is subdued. He has lost. He is completely undone. He now is the one that is dethroned. And remember Revelation 5? Who reigns now over this world and the world we can't see? It is Jesus Christ the righteous. He sits on the throne and he reigns as king of kings and lord of lords. He was the prophet that we needed. He is God's word in flesh come to us. He's the priest that we needed. He has brought us back into the presence of his father. And he is the king. He's the king who loved the law of God so much he died to pay for the cost of us disobeying that law. And now through His Spirit, through simple faith and that finished work, His Spirit abides within us and begins to change our heart of stone and turn us into the true image of God as we begin once again not to obey out of fear, not to obey out of pride, but to obey out of love. Love for the God that we understand now even better than Adam and Eve understood him. They knew he was beautiful and powerful and kind, but how much more, church, how much more does the Christian know how good God is? God is the God who will come in flesh and willingly stand in the place of his bride. He's a good, good God, and we know it now better than ever. And we can obey because we know Him. We love Him. And all of this is through His cross. And I can't unpack it all, but we see whispers even more of this redemptive plan right there in the text. I won't read them all for you, but what does He do? He covers their shame. God. Does He kill them immediately like it was do them? No. He lets them live. He takes an animal. A life has to die. And he clothes his sinful children. He covers their shame. And what does he do? He banishes them from Eden. You might say, well, that, that doesn't seem... You're saying that's an echo of grace? Oh, yes. What does he say? We must remove them from Eden lest they eat of the tree of life and live forever. Was that him being greedy? I don't want them to live forever. No. He, he's, God is not going to leave us in this state. He's not going to let us live eternally broken in our hearts, disconnected in our marriages, crushed in our world, rebellion in our ground. God's not going to leave us this way. No, no. He's going to remove us from his presence. We will die a natural death, but that's because one day we will be resurrected, church. This world will be made right. It will be made better than even Eden itself. So, simply, in even in this act of judgment, our God shows mercy by promising a deliverer, covering their shame, and keeping them from eternal brokenness. And all of this is found in Christ and His cross. So, church... If you're feeling the effects of sin, maybe you're saying, wow, 
Matt, I understand sin a lot more. Uh, I, I do obey a lot from pride. I do obey a lot from fear. What in the world am I supposed to do now? You've done nothing but discourage me. I know more about how messed up I am. Well, that's the beauty of it. When you get to that point where you feel like you really are messed up, you're beyond hope, that's when you need Jesus. That's the only time you really need him is when he's actually saving you from something that you can't save yourself from. And it's through feeling these broken relationships, broken sexuality, broken economies, a broken world. And even today, many of you, I know some of you, who have broken hearts for, for whatever reason. All of this flows from sin, but the only way out is found in Christ and His cross. At that moment, what He did for you to make this world right, it restores to the heart of us the love for God that we lost in Eden. And from that headwaters flows a recreative energy that begins to sanctify that broken, hardened heart. And we begin to see it take form even in this life. So church, we're going to keep going through this story. And I realize today is the low point that many ways we work out even to our present day. It's the fall. It's the answer to the question, what happened? Well, now you know. But I want you to cling to the fact that this love that Christ has brought us is what begins to teach us and change us and free us from the fall that we experienced here in Genesis 3. So I encourage you, look to Christ this morning. Look to His cross the act that happened there, and find hope in him. Can we pray together? God, our Father, we praise you for your goodness. Lord, we praise you that in your wisdom you gave us an opportunity to genuinely trust you or not. And God, even when you knew we would not, you did not kill us. You did not start over and erase us. You did not undo the fabric of this world. No, you kept going because from the very beginning, your plan was to show to all of creation, to show to all the cosmos what you were going to do in Jesus Christ. And we praise you for that. We thank you that this morning we are able to come to you and worship you because that finished work has been done on our behalf. Lord, we give all the praise this morning from the bottom of our hearts to our greater Adam, to our true husband, Jesus Christ the righteous. And we pray this in his name and authority. And the church said together, amen. Church, would you stand with me? This blessing is for the people of God spoken over you. Please receive it. May the Lord of Eden bless you and keep you. May the sun, the true and better Adam, shine upon you. And may the God of redemption lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both today and this week. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the church said together, Amen. You may be dismissed.